Some of you today may feel a little bit like you came in the middle of a movie, because this will be the fourth sermon in a series of sermons that I've been giving on history and prophecy. I was pondering, why is there so much variance in biblical interpretation and in prophetic interpretation in particular? It's largely, I think, a matter of perspective, and I think to a very large extent it's a matter of historical perspective. There are a lot of wild ideas being peddled around about the place, about prophecy, in particular about the Antichrist, the beast, and the number 666, and people handed me some literature on the trip that I looked at and did some reading in and found rather interesting to see some of the things and the ideas, the theories that people are advancing about the Antichrist and the beast. But some of them were so far out that, that I, I, I found myself saying, how, how did they come to this conclusion? It seems so obvious to me that it's not correct what they're saying. Why can't they see that? And as I thought about it, I began to realize that what most people, I think, do is they turn over to the book of Revelation, chapter 13, and they read along in chapter 13 about this beast and the image of the beast and the second beast and about the number of his name and the mark of the beast and so forth, and they begin to speculate about what that might be. And they try to look ahead into the future to try to see the future somehow, as though the future is already there, but what they have to do is find some way of seeing it. And I find that virtually everybody I read on the subject of prophecy seems to utterly ignore the warning or, let's say, the, the uh, challenge that, that God produced through the prophet Isaiah when he said, Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare us things to come. Now the challenge is, if you're going to show me about prophecy, you're going to tell me the future, what I want you to do is to show me the former things what they be, so that I may ponder them, consider them, weigh them, and come to understand the latter end thereof. It's a very significant statement that Isaiah makes. You'll find it in Isaiah 41, beginning in verse 21. He then continues to say, Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Yea, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and behold it together. Behold, you are of nothing, and your work of naught. An abomination is he that chooses you. Who's he talking to? Well, the idols. And the challenge to these idols are, show us the future if you think you're a god. Show us what's going to happen. But the interesting part of the challenge, as I said, is this, this statement. Show us the former things that we can understand the latter end thereof. I'm reminded of Solomon's words. You'll find them in the first chapter of Ecclesiastes, beginning in verse 9. The thing that has been is that which shall be. You with me? The thing which has been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new, it has been already of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things. Or basically what he's saying is, why is it that, that there is no remembrance of former things? Neither is there going to be any remembrance of the things that are to come with those that shall come afterward. Basically, he's saying, how come it is that people don't look back and remember the things that, came, that took place? They just don't do this. Just like the people in the generation to follow this generation will not look back at what happened here and remember what happened now for the sake of the future. As someone once said, those that cannot remember, the his remember history, the lessons of history, are condemned to repeat them. And so it goes over and over again. And so he who would understand prophecy must not start with the future. And I feel this is the fundamental mistake that so many people make when they begin to study prophecy. They begin to try to understand the future. First of all, you need to understand that prophecy and future are not the same thing. Prophecy exists. The future does not exist. Now, one chief purpose of most prophets that you'll find in the Bible is to determine future events. You know what I mean by that? 
Well, the prophet comes wandering into town, and he says, Repent! Turn away from your evil doings, or the Lord shall destroy this place and all of yours and all of your things and, and your children of the third and fourth generation. Why is that message being given? It is to change the here and now in order that the future might be different from what it otherwise would be. Implication? If you do not repent, you will be destroyed. If you repent, you will not be re destroyed. Which immediately says there are two quite different, at least two quite different, options that are available for the future. So the future, does the future exist? No, it does not, except as a concept in the mind. It is not here yet. As Jesus said to a group of people, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. But there is a choice involved in the human decisions that are involved. We're all familiar with the example of Jonah and Nineveh. Yet forty days, he said, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. But Nineveh repented, and Nineveh was not overthrown. The prophet sees the future as a consequence of the present, just as the present is a consequence of the past. The things that they did yesterday are determining the outcomes that are going on around us right now today. And the things that we are doing today will determine the things that are going to be taking place tomorrow. If we can change the present course of events for some people, we can change the future for those people. Hence, prophecy. A prophet is sent in the whole power of vain, in many cases, to change the outcome of present events. Now, in some cases, present events have gone along a certain distance too far, and the prophet has come to tell us the certainty of what is going to take place, because it is too late to change the outcome. But in most cases, a prophet is sent with bad news in love that that bad news or that bad situation might be averted. He who would understand prophecy then must look back, not forwards. Or in looking forward, you're looking into where there is nothing to see. It's not there yet. You're looking into blackness. Possibly the greatest source of error among many students of prophecy is the, the assumption that the future already exists and may be discovered in the sense that Columbus discovered America. America. The future does not exist. It is created by today's events. It grows out of history. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and have not love, I am nothing. Love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Now, you have to realize that if the future exists as a concrete, predetermined course of events, then prophecy cannot fail. Because the only way prophecy then could fail would be that the prophecy itself was a lie. You follow me? Prophecy can fail because the future does not yet exist, but is oftentimes determined and changed by what, what might have been because of the prophecy having been given. Now, with all this in mind, I've been going back to the roots of prophecies in a series of sermons which I've called History and Prophecy, and this one will be History and Prophecy, Part 4. The object is to lay a groundwork for the understanding of prophecy. And we have, up until this point, covered the first 80 years of the what we call the divided kingdom. By that we mean that the, the period of time subsequent to the death of Solomon and the time in which the kingdom of Israel was divided into two armed camps. The kingdom of Judah, headquartered at Jerusalem, and the kingdom of Israel, headquartered later in Samaria, uh, a little bit vague about where their headquarters were prior to this time, but the ten northern tribes, exclusive of Judah and Benjamin, who stayed in the, in, in the south, and, of course, Benjamin, who stayed with Judah in the south. So we have been looking to try to understand... The, the history of these events, the outcome of these events, and somehow get a, a grip on what might be happening in the future. Not that we can foretell it with absolute accuracy, but so that as we read the prophecies, we will begin to get a grasp of what the prophet is aiming at and understand the prophecy. For if you understand the prophecy, then the events will make sense to you as they begin to take place before your very eyes. Some of them you will recognize and know what is to happen before it takes place, because you understand prophecy, and because you see the things taking place and unfolding as they were foretold to do. Well, I want you to turn back with me now to Second Kings, the 22nd chapter, and verse 40. We come to a watershed in a lot of ways in the history of Israel, because 
we get to the end of the reign of the king whom, whom, of whom it is said that he was the worst of any of them up to this time, that he seems to have done worse than all the rest of them put together, as a matter of fact, before him. And yet we learn of this king that when he repented at the preaching or at the warning of Ahab, that God actually turned aside from very serious, dire threats that he had made against Ahab because he humbled himself, clothed himself in sackcloth, and went softly. God said, It shall not come in his days. I'll bring it in the days of his son. And yet we also realize that had his son repented, God would have said the same thing where the son was concerned until the curse could have been removed from Ahab's family forever had they continued to repent. So, verse 40, Ahab slept with his fathers, and Ahaziah his son reigned in his stead. And Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, began to reign in Judah in the fourth year of Ahab, the king of Israel. Now, you must be careful as you read along through Kings and Chronicles and, and, uh, to understand that these do not follow in clear chronological sequence because it's moving you back and forth between the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. Remember, we're in the time of the divided kingdom. So it first of all tells you the death of Ahab. Then it steps over into Judah, but it has to back up to the year to about year 62 when Ahab died in year 80. And we come to the fourth year of Ahab was when uh, Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, began to reign in Judah. He was 35 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azubah, the daughter of uh, Shilhi, and he walked in the ways of Asa, his father. He turned not aside from it, doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away, for the people offered and burned incense yet in the high places. Jehoshaphat made peace with the king of Israel. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and his might which he showed and how he warred, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And the remnant of the gay community that remained in the days of his father Asa, he took out of the land. The New English Bible translates that word sodomites as male prostitutes, that uh, these were taken out of the land. And in the process of doing so, he removed what is probably the largest single pool, reserve pool of venereal disease that exists in any society, and doubtless made a great deal of difference in the health of the people in the years to come. There was then no king, he says, in Edom. A deputy was king. Jehoshaphat made ships to go to Tarshish, uh, of, of Tarshish, to go to Ophir for gold, but they didn't go. They were broken at Ezion Geber. Then said Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, to Jehoshaphat, Let my servants go with your servants in the ships. But Jehoshaphat would not. Just a, a little aside into the history of the time. They may have some significance if they ever find the location where these ships were broken, and there are some archaeologists who feel they have found this particular place. Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, and Jehoram his son reigned in his stead. Ahaziah the son of Ahab began to reign over Israel and Samaria in the seventeenth year of Jehoshaphat king of Judah and reigned for two years over Israel. Now we're back in the north again, year 80 to 82, somewhere in the approximation. Now you're going to find, if you check cross-check very carefully on the dates that I'm giving you, that some variance in them. <coughs> and it depends on a lot of things as these dates vary. <coughs> the Assyrian chronology will vary from Ushers, and Ushers is uh, not entirely reliable along the way. There's so many variables about how you actually count interregnums and people who, uh, let's say, whose reign overlaps someone else in the same kingdom. I'm not trying to be precise in a chronology, only to give you a general feeling of the passage of time. And he did evil. In the sight of the Lord, he walked in the way of his father, and the way of his mother, and the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. For he served Baal, and worshipped him, and provoked to anger the Lord of God of Israel, according to all his father had done. As I said before, you're going to keep on hearing this. It, it becomes almost ad nauseum, the, the, the way it keeps being repeated. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who did sin, and made Israel to sin. Again and again and again, this indictment is passed upon the kings of Israel. Continuing now into 2 Kings, Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. Now we're in Israel, mind you, not Judah. And he sent messengers and said to them, Go inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise and go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, Is it not because there is not a god in Israel that you go to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron? 
Now therefore thus saith the Lord, You shall not come down from that bed on which you are gone up, but you shall surely die. And Elijah departed. Notice the tact, the diplomacy, the soft peddling of all of the, uh, the message that he had. He's an incredible man, Elijah. And you get, I think, some insight into his nature in the way in which the, that those particular messages that God has are delivered through this man. There is one thing that, that just keeps coming home to me and keeps coming home to me as I study through these passages. Here we are again, living in a time when doubtless people were every bit as immoral as we are today, with all of the sins of the flesh that could possibly be in existence, and even down in Judah with male prostitutes being fairly commonly found until a king finally got rid of all of them. But realizing all of this, what is incredible is that hardly any of the prophets seem to have anything at all to say about these sins of the flesh that people were involved in. Again and again and again, when the correction comes, when the prophetic intervention comes, it has to do with the first commandment. It has to do with idolatry, with the rejection of God himself personally. It's very interesting when you realize this, and I, I've, I've more and more recently began to realize that the, the carelessness, I think, that can creep into people's lives and their attitude toward God and their respect for Him and their respect for His name, to the point that you find people who will write a letter, uh, a, you know, it's even an infamous letter, even a letter that contains lies and then sign the lie and saying, in Jesus' name. We had one recently like that that just... just just boggled my mind. And I thought, have people so little respect for his name that they would sign his name to a letter in which Jesus has nothing to do with the letter? Wouldn't have anything to do with the letter and wouldn't have anything to do with the person who wrote the letter because of the way he's lived his life. And yet the person signs that letter in Jesus' name. Well, I think that's a clear violation of the commandment not to take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. But here is an interesting situation. Now, you know, it is one thing. To be unfaithful to God. It is another thing to flaunt it in his face. It is one thing to, you know, just, just, just you know, go off and leave God and go wandering off. But it's another thing to deliberately get your messengers up when there is a prophet of God a few miles from you, right here in your own country, not very far down the road, and you send right by him all the way to Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, to inquire whether I shall recover of this disease. You begin to see how then that God will, you know, gets, gets Elijah and sends him out to intercept these men and turns them around and sends them back. And here again, the whole question is, God, who is he? What is he? What does he stand for? Do you know him? Well, it's very interesting to see the, the approach that was taken here once this man had gotten this message back. When the messengers turned back to him, he said to them, why are you now turned back? And they said to him, Well, there came a man up to meet us, and he said, Go turn again to the king that sent you, and say to him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that you send to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Wherefore you shall not come down off that bed on which you are gone up. You shall surely die. Now, in years gone by, uh, somewhat has been said about this Beelzebub, the god of Ek Ekron, being the god of medicine, and that... This sending to Beelzebub is the, is, was somehow equated with the idea of a person going to see a doctor about his illness. Allow me to assure you that there is absolutely no connection between them at all. I heard one minister once upon a time only half-jokingly refer to the college infirmary as, as the Temple of Ekron, and uh, making the reference to this type of thing, which was, uh, I mean, I don't really know for sure where he was coming from at the time. I think he learned better than that subsequently. But, People have, and this has been used in the past to try to uh, make people feel that somehow there's something wrong about going to a doctor or consulting a doctor. And, of course, the absurdity of it becomes apparent very rapidly when you've got a broken arm. And here's the thing flopping around and in excruciating pain. And you sit there and you say to yourself, am I going to pray, you know, that this arm will be reset and pull itself back together again? Or am I going to go to the doctor and get this thing set and put in a plaster cast and let's get this pain stopped? Nobody really has much of a question about that, do they? And yet somehow other people have a hard time, or have had a hard time, making the distinction between that and, and other things that a doctor can quite legitimately do to help a person out of his difficulty. This is a case of going to another god, not going to somebody who 
may be a Christian, may not be a Christian, may be who knows what, but he considers himself to be a scientist who is going to practice medical science in whatever way he can or the medical arts on your body to try to make you better while you yourself still trust God and look to Him for your healing. In fact, you can find doctors around the place who believe in God and believe very much in prayer and will support you in your desire to trust in God for your healing, interestingly enough. And it would be absolute blasphemy to try to say that those men were representing Beelzebub, the god of Ekron. I'm sure they would be profoundly offended by any such suggestion. Well, he's, when, he, when he told them this message, he said, What manner of man was he that came up to meet you and told you these words? He answered and said, Well, he was a hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, almost like the voice of doom, It is Elijah the Tishbite. The king then sent to him a captain of fifty with his fifty. He went up to him, and behold, he sat on the top of a hill. And he spoke to him, You man of God, the king has said, Come down. Do you, do you catch the absurdity in that statement? You man of God. Now, how in the world could you believe that this man is of God, who's sitting up here on the side of this hill, that I can tell him what to do? This man is, you know, is a man of God, not a man of the king. The sarcasm is very implicit in the statement. You, man of God, the king has said, come down, as though the king could give orders to a man of God. Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty, searing fire from heaven and fifty charred bodies lying in the street or in the roadway out in front of him here. It's a sobering thing to contemplate, isn't it? That God in heaven backed that up in that way. Why would this be done so severely and so strongly? Because of the contempt that was shown toward God through this whole episode. The utter and complete contempt, not of Elijah, for Elijah would not have considered himself to be anything of any importance at all. But he just said, if I am a man of God, then let's all learn a lesson about God. Again, he sent him another captain of fifty with his fifty. And he answered and said to him, O man of God, thus has the king said, Come down quickly. They're still giving orders to the man of God. And Elijah answered and said, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Now we've got a hundred people, or a hundred and two, dead. I'm not sure how I would count it. As a result of the, the failure to acknowledge that this indeed is a man of God of God, and you don't try to tell God what to do. He sent again a captain of the third fifty with his fifty. And the third captain went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah. Now we're getting somewhere. Now we're getting somewhere. Now at long last somebody has come to realize there is a God in heaven. And that he, this, this is, after all, a man who belongs to is a representative of a messenger of God, not somebody else. The time has come for me to fall on my knees. And he besought him and said, O man of God, I pray you, let my life and the life of these fifty your servants be precious in your sight. Behold, there came down fire from heaven and burnt up the two captains of the former fifties with their fifties. Therefore, let my life now be precious in your sight. No commands. No demands, no assertions of power or kingly authority, just simply the recognition finally at long last that God might just be involved in all these goings on. I think a lot of people, perhaps in the process of studying the book of Revelation, have overlooked a rather interesting connection, the connection between the two witnesses and this man. The two witnesses are going to have fire, it says, can proceed out of their mouth and consume their enemies. The two witnesses are going to stop heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy for three and a half years. Elijah stopped it for three and a half years. The connection, again, people look ahead and do all sorts of speculations and wonderings about the two witnesses and never go back to make the historic connection, never really realize who these people are and what their message is and what their work is and what Elijah is supposed to do at the end time. But he then says, the, an angel spoke to Elijah and said, You can go down with him. Be not afraid of him. 
So he arose and went down with him and went to the king. And he said to him, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as you have sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it not because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore you shall not come down off that bed on which you are gone up, but you shall surely die. So he died. Now, this was quoted in a healing booklet many years ago, I think, as an example of a person who sought to someone other than God for healing, and he died. That is not the case. He died because he looked to another God, other than the true God. The healing was almost irrelevant to the whole thing in his illness. The question was a question of idolatry. He died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken. And Jehoram reigned in his stead. In the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, because he had no son. Now you have, there are two Jehorams who will be reigning at the same time. It's a little bit confusing. But Jehoram in Judah was regent from the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, which would be around year 79. And this is one of those situations where you have an overlap uh, in the two kings that exist at the same time. Uh, so consequently, your chronologies tend to get jerked out of position a little bit if you're not careful when you go through here. Now, the rest of the acts of Ahaziah, which he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kingdom, or sorry, the kings of Israel? Chapter 2 is a particularly fascinating segment of the Bible that has drawn uh, a lot of attention over the years from students of the prophecy and, and students of the Bible as people have wondered and speculated about some of the things that took place. It came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now, this is somewhere around year 84 of the divided kingdom. Elijah, Ahab is about two years dead, putting it another way at this time. Elijah said to Elisha, Tarry here, I pray you, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. Now, what is interesting about this is that there are two or three occasions here where Elijah seems to try to get rid of Elijah, Elisha. He wants him to stay behind. He, he keeps telling him, uh, you, you stay here. Stay in Bethel. I mean, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. You stay here. Elisha said to him, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went on down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets which were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from your head today? And he said, Yes, I know it. Hold your peace. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, I pray you, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. And so they came on to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, Don't you know that the Lord will take away your master from your head today? He answered and said, Yes, yes, I know it. Keep quiet. And Elijah said to him, Terry, I pray you here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. And they, too, went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they, too, stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle, wrapped it together, and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither, so they, too, went over on dry ground. It came to pass that when they were gone over, that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I be taken away from you. And Elisha said, I pray you, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. He said, you have asked a hard thing. You know, when I think about that, I said, now what did he mean by that? Did he mean it was a hard thing for God to do? Oh, of course not. And nothing's hard like that for God to do. Then in what sense is it a hard thing? Well, do you suppose that Elijah's spirit was ever a burden to him? Do you suppose that there were times when he lay awake in the night and couldn't sleep because of the things that he had had to do, because of the people who were dead, because of the word that God had spoken through him, that there were that he was a man so insensitive that he could witness the fiery death of 50 men and not be moved by it, that he was the sort of man who wouldn't be torn up by the personal rejection that oftentimes comes to a prophet of God? And here was this young man looking at him, and he was a relatively young man, for Elisha will, after Elijah is taken away, continue to work for another 58 years as a prophet. And you think about this, and you realize he was asking for a double dose of the spirit of one of the most 
powerful prophets, who, in fact, the archetype of all prophets, a man who was a bearer of bad news almost exclusively, a man who carried a very heavy burden around on his shoulders, I think most of the time, most of his life, who probably was hated by more people by a long shot than, than loved him, without any question. And I think when he says this to Elisha, he says, you've asked for a hard thing when you say you want a double portion of my spirit. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so unto you, but if not, it shall not be so. So it was not an absolutely predetermined, ironclad event that it would happen so. In the first place, Elijah, Elisha may very well have turned back at about three or four junctures along the road in getting to this place in the length of time that they took to get there. But he didn't. He stayed with it, and he was there right to the bitter end. If you see me, it shall be so. If not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass that as they still went on and talked, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now, by heaven, it means the heavens above us here on the earth. For uh, I won't go into it today, but a letter was received back much, much later than this event from Elijah, which shows that he was still alive and somewhere else on the earth at this time. It's just that his prophetic work, his mission in Israel was over as of this particular moment in time. Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. I can imagine that he was absolutely devastated as he, you know, going through this experience. Well, I mean, how would you feel standing there in this way? He looked at his feet, and there lay on the ground a mantle, the mantle had not fallen upon him. It had fallen upon the ground. He reached over, and he picked it up. He took up also the mantle that of Elijah that fell from him, and he went back and he stood by the river of Jordan. I think it's rather interesting to think about this and ponder on it for a little bit, because this is a very, very rare instance in the Bible, an instance of, of prophetic succession where a prophet legitimately succeeds another straight into the same office of the preceding prophet. For Elisha has no separate ministry. He actually is a continuation in greater power of the ministry of Elijah. He's not somebody different, spe figuratively speaking. He is a, the same person. Even their names are so close to the same, Elijah and Elisha, as we all have noted, of course, in years past. He stands by the river now at this point in time, but without a single doubt in his mind of the power that he has. And he takes the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and he smote the waters, and he said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? When he had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elijah, Elisha, went over. The new prophet, the young prophet, comes back. And for 58 years to follow, this man will do exploits that will pale into insignificance at times, the things that Elijah did. And that those who thought that Elijah was getting old and wouldn't have to put up with him much longer must have been dismayed to realize that now we, we have the younger man, and the spirit is still here, and the same attitude is still here, and the same power is still here, and it seems like it's even more so. Fifty-eight years, all the way to the 142nd year, approximately, of the, of the divided kingdom, this man will work and will prophesy. When the sons of the prophets which were to view, uh, were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah does rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Oh, not doing obeisance to Elisha, for he himself was a man. But they realized that the power and the spirit of God rested upon him, and they stood in incredible awe of that power. It's really remarkable to read along in these things and see the things that take place and how that Elisha took up the mantle, which he could have walked off and left had he been the sort of man who might have done so. But he refused to do so, but had to go on. He knew he had a calling and knew he had a responsibility <coughs> and knew that it was there for him to do. Second Kings chapter 3. Jehoram the son of Ahab began to reign over Israel and Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat king of Judah and reigned for 12 years. This is about year 82 uh, to year 94. As we continue on now, we're in the northern kingdom still. He wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father, 
and like his mother, for he put away the image of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he cleaved to the, to the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. Mesha king of Moab was a sheep master, and he rendered to the king of Israel a hundred thousand lambs, a hundred thousand rams with the wool. It came to pass that when Ahab was dead, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. And King Jehoram went out of Samaria at the same time and numbered all Israel. Now, the, this question of numbering of Israel, essentially what he's talking about is conscription. It's not a census. It's not really going out and let's getting all the census data together. For the idea of numbering the people and knowing how many people you've got out there is no big deal. But the point is he was numbering them for war, which means conscription, which implies a military draft. He went and said to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me against Moab to battle? And he said, I will go up. So for rare occasion, we have Israel and Judah together in a battle that's going to be going on. He said, I am as you are, and my people as your, as your people, my horses as your horses. And he said, which way shall we go up? He said, through the way of the wilderness of Edom. So the king of Israel went, and the king of Judah, and the king of Edom joined them. And they fetched a compass of seven days' journey. There was no water for the host and for the cattle that followed them. And the king of Israel said, Alas, that the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hands of Moab. Now, here they were out here. There was no water. They were in really sore distress. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Edom, went down to Elisha. And Elisha said to the king of Israel, What do I have to do with you? Get to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. And the king of Israel said, Nay, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. This is interesting. Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts live before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward you nor see you. He had absolute, total contempt for the king of Israel. But he did respect Jehoshaphat. Not because I think maybe Jehoshaphat was that righteous, but because the kingdom of Judah had not deserted him the way that the kingdom of Israel had done. He then goes on to say, But now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass, when the minstrel played, that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches, and proceeds a, a fascinating prophecy. What is really interesting here <coughs> is the fact that before he could prophesy, he had to have a minstrel. Language in the, is, is filled with imagery. It is, it is highly symbolic. The language is extremely compact. It is designed to carry an emotional reaction as much as it is simple data along the way. And really, I think sometimes people do not understand prophecy not only because they don't understand the history, but they do not understand the literary form in which the prophecy is actually cast. Nor do they recognize that when they read through the Psalms, they read prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. Most of them are prophecies that were done by someone when the minstrel played and the hand of the Lord came upon him and he prophesied before the people that were there. And so then it finds its way into the Bible as poetry, and is read as a lovely poem and is like one who sings upon a pleasant instrument and people never realize that it's a prophecy that could have life or death value to them if they could simply understand the language, the structure, the, the feeling that the, the, this particular poem is intended to convey to them in the warning. Well, the result of all this was that water came through this valley and filled all the ditches. The kings of Moab looked out and because the sunrise was on it, thought it was blood and were came rushing down unprepared and were destroyed and, and, and sent back in total defeat was the result of this particular incident that took place. It suited God on this occasion to give even the king of Israel a victory for reasons that he doesn't entirely explain. In chapter 4 of Second Kings, there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant did fear the Lord. And, uh, the, and the creditor has come to take to him my two sons to be bondmen. Elisha said, What shall I do for you? Tell me what you have in the house. Well, what happened in this situation was that she had 
to the oil, the cruise of oil. And he told her to go get pots and pans and so forth, to bring every vessel she could find of any sort, shape, or fashion into the house, and then start close the doors and start pouring them full. And when she got through, she'd filled every vessel in the house with oil. She still had the thing originally was that she had was completely full. He says, go sell all this oil, pay all of your debts, and you live on the residue thereof. Quite a blessing that came to her. An interesting little sidelight. This is the kind of thing that finds its way into sermonettes from time to time. If you had been out, sent out and said, go gather all you can in the way of pots and pans and so forth, without realizing what was going to happen, would you have gathered ten? Would you have stopped with twenty? Would you have gone on to eighty? Would you have been satisfied with a hundred and twenty? Where would you have stopped in the gathering of pots and pans and before you got yourself into the house, closed the door, and began to pour? You find this particular little incident takes place and kind of wonder why it is in the Bible. And you'll find another one later that has a similar import to it as whenever you're told to do something, do it with your might. Do it fully. Work hard at it. Carry it out right to the limit because it could be very critical for you in a long run as to just how all this would work out. Also, what is interesting in this, it says in verse 8, It fell on the day that Elisha passed to Shunem, and there was a great woman. She constrained him, constrained him to eat bread, and so it was, as often as he passed by, he turned then there to eat. Well, it's because he was staying there quite a lot, she asked her husband, and he agreed, and they prepared a permanent room for Elisha when he was there. It was an austere little room, just a bed and a candlestick and a stool and a table was all he had. But it was a place, and it was a place he knew he could come on a regular basis. And one day he called the woman in and said, What can I do for you? And she didn't even know what to ask. But because of the time and because of being able to understand what she may have most desired, he told her she was going to have a son, which indeed she did. In the process of time, the child went out to the reapers, apparently got sunstroke, and the child died. And she, torn up completely by it, went to Elisha. And Elisha came... I could read the whole story about how he stretched himself out upon the child and wanted to, to try to warm the child's body and placed his mouth on the child's mouth and speculate about uh, resuscitation. But the one thing the Bible account leaves no doubt is this child was beyond resuscitation by the time he came to the scene. What is particularly significant is that Elisha joins the very, very rare ranks of men who have raised somebody from the dead, the kind of power that we are talking about in this particular man. He goes on, of course, and performs any number of miracles, a lot of them I think you would find of, of considerable interest if you were to study them. And this, this segment going all the way down to chapter 8, I think does merit your careful study and, and your careful pondering over it to see the type of thing that God did, the, the, the kind of changes that he wrought, the, the power that Elisha had, which had so many things that were being done that none of these type of things seemed to have happened at all when Elijah was a prophet, he seems to have been nothing really but a, a, a preacher, whereas Elisha was a miracle worker of the first order. But come on down with me to Second Kings chapter 8. Elisha came to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, was sick. It was told him, saying, The man of God has come hither. And the king sent, said to Hazael, Take a present in your hand, and go meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? This is quite a different approach. He wasn't sending somewhere else. This is, by the way, a Gentile who recognizes that Elisha is a prophet. All right, he goes on uh, here to point out. Be careful, I haven't lost my place here along the way. Uh, there, another particular instance, by the way, that we did pass over was the example of Naaman, who was the, the, the leper who came all the way to Israel to be healed of his lepr leprosy. And interestingly enough, again, and th this example is quoted in the New Testament, that there were all sorts of lepers in uh, Israel in, the, in these days. None of them were healed, but Naaman the Syrian was healed, trying to underline the fact that oftentimes it is the Gentiles who will listen to God, whereas Israel would not listen to it. But this a Gentile king sends again to the man of God, shall I recover of this disease? So Hazael went to meet him and took a present with him, even of every good thing of Damascus, forty camels burdened, and came and stood before him and said, Your son Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, has sent me to you, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? And Elisha said to him, Go and say unto him, You may certainly recover, howbeit the Lord has shown me that he shall surely die. That's strange, isn't it? Why in the world would he send a message back to say to the man, You may surely recover, when he knew that God had shown him that he was surely going to die? The answer is really quite simple as you continue reading on. 
that he, that is, Elisha, settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed and he began to weep. And Hazael said, Why are you weeping, my lord? He answered, Because I know the evil that you will do to the children of Israel. Their strongholds will you set on fire. Their young men will you slay with a sword and will dash their children and rip up their women with child. And Hazael said, But what? Is your servant a dog that he should do this thing? Elisha answered, The Lord has shown me that you shall be king over Syria. He departed from Elisha, and he came to his master and said, What did Elisha say to you? He answered, He told me that you should surely recover. It came to pass on the morrow that he took a thick cloth, dipped it in water, and spread it on his master's face so that he died. And Hazael reigned in his stead. The point, Elisha said, You may surely recover, not that you will, but the Lord has shown me he shall surely die. Had he not been murdered, he would have recovered from the disease. And, of course, that made up Hazael's mind as to what he had to do. For had the king been told, yes, you're going to die, set your house in order, there would have been no need for murder. But whenever Hazael learned that he would recover, there was no alternative for him but to get rid of the old man in whatever way he could get rid of him. Hazael will become a major factor, in fact, in the future history of these two people as the king of Syria continually vexes the kingdom of Israel. In the fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab of, of Israel, Jehoshaphat being king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, began to reign. So now it has shifted us back to Judah. We're dealing with year 89, approximately up to year 97. Thirty-two years old was he when he began to reign. He reigned eight years in Jerusalem. He walked in the way of the king of Israel, as did the house of Ahab. Interestingly enough, now this is one of the rare instances of a king of Judah who follows that way. Why did he do it? Because the daughter of Ahab was his wife. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for David his servant's sake, as he promised him to give him always a light unto his children. In his days, Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah and made a king over themselves. So Joram went over to Zair and all the chariots with him, and he rose by night, <coughs> smote the Edomites which compassed him about, the captains of the chariots, and the people fled into their tents. But... Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah to this day. What is pictured by all this is the gradual erosion of the kingdom that David had built up. For David had conquered all these nations round about. He'd created a very, very large buffer zone around him. They had managed to keep a lot of these people, very warlike people and troublesome people, at peace with themselves and at peace with their neighbors year after year after year. But once the kingdom was, was divided, and once the nation began to forget God and began to become corrupted, they slowly but surely began to lose control of all the power that they'd had at the international level. Not an insignificant thing, <coughs> excuse me, when we began to discuss prophecy and the, the long-term implications of current events, as a matter of fact. In the twelfth year, verse 25, of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, began to reign. We're getting up now to where around year 101 and year 102 in the divided kingdom. He reigned 20, He was 22 years old, I'm sorry, when he began to reign. He reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, the daughter of Omri, the king of Israel. Now we're getting down to talking about some more of these people from up north who had intermarried down in the south and brought their customs with them. He walked in the way of the house of Ahab. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, as did the house of Ahab, for he was the son-in-law <clears throat> of the house of Ahab. So he went in with Joram, the son of Ahab, to the war against Hazael, king of Syria, in Ramoth-Gilead, and the Syrians wounded him. King Joram went back to be healed in, in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him at Ramah when he fought against Hazael, the king of Syria. Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see him because he was sick. <clears throat> now, in chapter 9, a rather remarkable incident takes place. We've gone away now from it, Judah back up into Israel. <clears throat> Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets and said to him, Gird up your loins and take this box of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth-Gilead. And when you come there, look out, Jehu the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, go in and make him arise from among his brethren and carry him to an inner chamber. Then take the box of oil, pour it on his head, and, th and say, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed you to be the king over Israel. Then open the door and flee, and don't tarry. Now this, this whole picture, this 
is, is, is so abrupt in the whole message of what is going to take place here. You can imagine the reaction. This guy comes in, takes a box of oil, pours it on your head, says, The Lord has anointed you to be king over Israel. Out the door he goes. Why? What, what, is, what is the haste involved in all this? Well, let's read some more of the account. The young man, even the young man the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he came, behold, the captains of the host were sitting. He said, I have an errand unto you, O captain. And Jehu said, Unto which of all, of all of us? And he said, Unto you, O captain. Now, that gives you an idea that, of who this man was. He was not uh, the captain of all the host. He was one of several of them. Somebody comes in and says, I have a message for you, captain. He says, Which captain? He rose and went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head, and he said to him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. You shall smite the house of Ahab your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish. I will cut off from Ahab every male, him that is shut up and left in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. I don't know how you'd have felt, but I would have been absolutely astonished if I had been Jehu standing there. And some guy comes in and without me knowing anything or having any impulse and being one of a whole bunch of captains, having that kind of a message pronounced to me, he came forth. And probably looking a little bit astonished, as a matter of fact, to the men who had been around him before that prophet came there, at the realization of what had been done to him and of the realization of the things that he was called upon to do. And I've often thought that God chooses people. It doesn't make people into what they are, but he chooses people sometimes because of the kind of person they are. I think he chose Elijah because Elijah was a man of few words and a very abrupt man who got straight to the point and then got out. He didn't, wasn't the sort of a person to mince words or bandy words or to soft pedal anything that he had to say. And because he had a certain type of message he wanted preached, because he had a certain type of thing that he wanted done, he used that man and not another one. Now comes the task that must be done. There's something that, a rather unpleasant task that must be done, and he seems to have chosen a man to do it who was suited for the task. Jehu came forth to the servants of the Lord, and one said to him, Is all well? Where did this fellow come from? And he said to them, You know the man in his communication. Now, I don't know whether he was assuming at this point that this man, that they had put him up to it, or that this was a joke, but they said, If it's false, we don't know. Tell us now. And he said, Well, thus and thus he spoke to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. And so they hasted, took every man his garment, and put it under him on the top of the stairs, and blew with trumpets, saying, Jehu is king. So Jehu the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. Now Joram had kept Ramoth Gilead, he and all Israel, because of Hazael, king of Syria. King Joram was returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him when he fought with Hazael. And Jehu said, If it be in your minds, then let none go forth nor escape out of the city to go tell it in Jezreel. So Jehu rode in the chariot, went to Jezreel, for Joram lay there. And Ahaziah the king of Judah was come down to see him. There stood a watchman on the tower in Jezreel, and he spied the company of Jehu as he came, and he said, I see a company. Joram said, Take a horseman and send to meet them, and let them say, Is it peace? So there went one on horseback to meet him, and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu said, What have you to do with peace? Turn in behind me. And the messenger came to them, but he didn't come back again. He sent out a second one on horseback, which came to them. I'm sorry, he asked the watchman, saying, What happened uh, to this, this, what, this man? He said, Well, he came to them, but he didn't come back out of the group. So he sent a second messenger on horseback, which came to them, and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu answered, What have you to do with peace? Turn behind me. And the watchman told, saying, Well, he came to them, and he isn't coming out again. But the driving, he said, is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. Even at that distance, he could tell. Joram said, Make ready. And his chariot was made ready. And so he went out, fully prepared to do battle. They met Jehu in the portion of Naboth, the Jezreelite. And it came to pass, when Joram saw Jehu, he said, Is it peace, Jehu? Which is amazing that by this time he would not know. And he answered, What peace? 
so long as the whoredoms of your mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. And Joram turned his hands and fled and said to Ahaziah, There is treachery, Ahaziah. Jehu drew a bow instantly with his full strength, smote Jehoram between his arms, and the arrow went out at his heart, and he sunk down in his chariot. Apparently he drove that thing completely through his body. So he was the kind of power that this man, you know, the kind of person he was. Then said Jehu to Bikdar, his captain, Take up and cast him in the portion of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite. Remember how that when I and you rode together after Ahab his father, the Lord laid this burden upon him. Surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth, the blood of his son, saith the Lord, and I will requite you in this plan. You remember? This was precisely what had to happen to Ahab because of the way he stole the vineyard and because of the way his wife Jezebel arranged the murder of this man, Naboth. Now therefore take and cast him into the plat of ground, according to the word of the Lord. When Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw all this, he fled by the way of the garden house. Jehu followed after him, saying, Smite him also in the chariot. And they did so at the going up of Gur, which is by the Eblim, and he fled to Megiddo and died there. This is one of the rare instances where the kingdom changes hand the same day, because the king of, the, of, of Judah dies the same day the king of Israel dies. His servants carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in his sepulcher with his fathers in the city of David. The eleventh year of Joram, the son of Ahab, began Ahaziah to reign over Judah. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. She painted her face and teared her head and looked out of the window. And as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, Had Zimri peace, who slew his master? He lifted up his face to the window, and he said, Who is on my side? Who? <clears throat> and there looked out at him two or three eunuchs, and they said, Throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses. And he trod her underfoot. He went on in, sat down, and ate a meal. <coughs> Just left the body lying out of the streets. Kind of a strange circumstance. It, 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 it is so foreign to the way of thought of most of us to consider this. After he had gotten through eating and drinking, he said, Go now and see this cursed woman and bury her, for she is, after all, a king's daughter. And when they went to bury her, they found nothing of her but her skull and the feet and the palms of her hand. Wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel. So they may not say, This is Jezebel. He didn't intend for our tour guides, as it were, to be wandering along. Now, you see this tent tomb over here. This is where Jezebel is buried, and so on and so forth. This was not going to happen. Her body would be scattered hither and yon, wherever it was. You know, this is all extremely frightening in a lot of ways when you see the incredible violence that is ensuing in this particular circumstance. But what this man will now do, he will send around the countryside. You know, Ahab had 70 sons living in Samaria. So Jehu wrote letters and sent them to Samaria to every one of the rulers, the elders, and them that brought up Ahab's children. The whole group of them, all of them got their own letter. And he said, Now as soon as this letter comes to you, seeing your master's sons are with you, and there are with you chariots and horses and a fenced city also, and armor, look out even the best and the nearest of your master's sons, set him on your, his father's throne, and fight for your master's house. He's actually telling him, Now, okay, you have all the sons of Ahab there. Now what you want you to do is to put one of them up, declare him king, and let's get down to business of fighting this war. Defend yourselves. But they were scared to death. And they said, Behold, two kings stood not before him. How in the world are we going to stand? And he that was over the house, and he that was over the city, the elders also, and the bringers up of the children, said to Jehu, We are your servants, and will do all that you shall bid us. We will not make any king. You do what's good in your eyes. He wrote a letter the second time to them, saying, If you are mine, and if you will listen to my voice, take you the heads of the men your master's sons, and come to me to Jezreel by tomorrow at this time. Now, the king's sons were 70 persons, were with the great men of the city that brought them up. And it came to pass, when the letter came to them, they took the king's sons and slew 70 persons and put their heads in baskets and sent him them to Jezreel. It's an incredible story. And even though it was prophesied that it had to happen, even though because of Ahab's sins and the sins of his own children that followed him, it's still mind-boggling and numbing to think in terms of 
baskets full of heads and coming down to Jezreel and then him saying to these people when they came down there, he said he had them lay these heads in two big heaps, 35 heads, I guess, in a heap, grisly sight, as these people came down there. And he left them lying there. And it came to pass in the morning, he went out and he stood. He said to all the people, You be righteous. Behold, I conspired against my master and I slew him. But who slew all these? You people are no better than I am. He pulled them into his own attitude and his own frame of mind and entrapped them into a situation where they could no longer criticize him for having slew his master. For indeed, they themselves had slain their master's sons. It's a, a terribly uh, grisly scene, and the events are rather frightening. Now, I want you to turn, keep your place here, but turn with me to Hosea for a rather interesting statement. Hosea was a prophet to the northern kingdom, writing considerably later than this, as a matter of fact. He says, In the word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. The Lord said to Hosea, Go and take you a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land has committed a great whoredom in departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived, and bare him a son. And the Lord said, Call his name Jezreel. Now he's hearkening back to the events of Jezreel and what he, of Jehu and what he did. For yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu. Now, this is interesting. I will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. Now, why, having given Jehu this commission, would God then in turn avenge all that blood upon him? The only thing I can conclude is that the man, while he was told that he had a certain mission to carry it out, carried it out with so much uh, vigor, so much vehemence, and so much further than God ever intended that it be carried, even to the destruction of the king of Judah, whom he had not been instructed to destroy, that he had brought this, this blood and this vengeance upon himself and upon his own house. What is fascinating about this is that while up until this time, the thing that you read again and again about the sins of the northern tribes of Israel are all idolatry, and the, the, the continual departing from God and His ways, the setting up a feast in the fifteenth day of the eighth month, the setting up of calves in Bethel and Dan, the, the setting up of priests of the lowest of the people, that again and again and again it's the departing from God, it's seeking to other gods, it is the first commandment again and again, that finally, though, we have come to a place of, of where we, the, the violence has reached such a fever pitch that this kind of an outburst of bloodshed can take place in the land and the man who perpetrates it continued to serve as king in the land for 28 years, I think it is, following this period of time. It's a very bloody time, at a time when violence had become very deeply entrenched in these people. Now, as I've said before in, in this series, in talking about these things, and what seems to have taken place in the first place is an abandonment of the first great commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength which then, in the years to follow, led to a total abandonment of the second commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, with all that that entailed. Now we are beginning to see the incredible buildup of violence that takes place in this land that eventually leads to four of the last five leaders of the, of, of the nation dying by the hand of their successor or by an assassin. It is mind-boggling to realize how deep-seated the whole trend of violence became in this people as a result of their having turned away from God and from his laws and the things that he commanded him to do. And so the violence began, and so the violence continued. And he laid a pattern here to, which would be following in the years to come, which would have, I think, profound consequences for the people. One of the next things he does, you can compliment him for, perhaps. He calls all the priests of Baal together, and he deceitfully says... Ahab served Baal little, Jehu shall serve him much. Bring all the priests and the followers of Baal together. So he gathered them all together, got them all in the house of Baal, some giant building there, and from one end to the other, a packed nose to nose and shoulder to shoulder and cheek to cheek, were all the worshippers of Baal in this place. He put all of his soldiers around the building after he got investments for all these people so they could all be identified. He said, start at the entrances and go through and kill them all. Don't let a single one of them escape alive. And so, 
They went right through the temple of Baal and destroyed everybody and turned it into a draft house. More blood, more violence. But the legacy of this violence was going to haunt this nation until the day, the day that it ceased to be a nation. So we're told in verse 28 of chapter 10, uh, 11, sorry, 10, Thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. He did one thing. He accomplished that. How be it? <coughs> From the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who, did, who made Israel to sin... He did not depart. He didn't turn away from them, to wit the golden calves that were in Bethel and in Dan. Those are the specific things that he retained. And the Lord said to Jehu, Because you have done well in executing what was right in my eyes, and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart, for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam which made Israel to sin, and as a consequence, the fact that he had done one thing or two things or three things good made no difference. All of the blood that he shed seems to have been brought back to his account. In verse 32, an interesting statement is made. In those days, the Lord began to cut Israel short. This seems to be a beginning. This seems to be a, a time of, of beginning to take away their power, of the destruction of their international influence, and a time when God begins to lay the groundwork for their eventual fall as a nation. Hazael smote them in all the coasts of Israel, from Jordan eastward, all the land of Gilead, the Gadites, the Reubenites, the Manassites, from Aroer by the river Arnon, even Gilead and Bashan, which are the areas across Jordan of Israel. All the acts of Jehu and the rest that he did, they're all written in the books of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. So he slept with his fathers, they buried him in Samaria, and Jehoahaz his son reigned in his stead. About year 125. Now, there is much more that could be studied in, in these passages. Athaliah, when she heard that her son was dead, it takes you back now to the time when Jehu killed her son. She went ahead and destroyed all the seed royal, went out and destroyed all the children, except for one that was hidden from her that she didn't know was hidden, and that survived all this. His name was Joash. And Joash would eventually reign in Israel. The account of that is found in chapter 11 as it began, goes on through, explaining the things that took place there. But I want to pass on down quickly now to... Chapter 13. Chapter 13. In the three and twentieth year of Joash, the son of Azor, I'm sorry, Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel and Samaria. He reigned for seventeen years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He did not depart from them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. He delivered them into the hand of Hazael, the king of Syria, into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael, all their days. Jehoahaz besought the Lord, and the Lord listened to him, for he saw the oppression of Israel, because the king of Israel oppressed them. And he gave them a savior, so they went out from under the hand of the Syrians, and the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before time. So you have a, you have a relief. There is a short period of time here toward this that, because even though the king was evil, and even though he did not turn back away from his evil doings, he still cried out to God for relief. And God was moved by the oppression that Israel was suffering, and he gave them some peace. But they still didn't depart from the sins of the, of the house of Jeroboam, who made Israel sin, but walked therein, and there remained also a grove in Samaria. In other words, idolatry. He said all these things happened, and they still continued with these things. Neither did he leave of the people to Jehoahaz with fifty horsemen and ten chariots and ten thousand footmen, for the king of Assyria had destroyed them all. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoahaz and all that he did in his might, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? He slept with his fathers, they buried him in Samaria, and Joash his son reigns in his stead. In the thirty-seventh year of Joash king of Judah began Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, to reign over Israel and Samaria. And here goes another sixteen-year reign of the same sort, of on and on again, off again, service of God, the, the evil being done in the sight of God, the ref refusal to ref return from the sins of Jeroboam, as it says in verse 11, the son of Nebat who made Israel to sin, he continued in them. The rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did and all his might wherewith he fought against Amaziah, the king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? He died. He slept with his fathers in Jeroboam. This is Jeroboam the second now. We come full circle, I guess, in a way. Jeroboam II now reigns on the throne, carrying the same name as the man who started all this in the first place. Now, in verse 14, Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, whereof he died. 
You know, people oftentimes talk about sickness being a, a, something, a curse or something from the Lord. It would be strange indeed, wouldn't it, for us to look at Elisha this way? But this is the end of a 58-year ministry. He's an old man, and all of us are going to die of something sooner or later. In his case, he finally fell sick of the sickness of which he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him, and he wept over his face, and he said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said to him, Take bow and arrows. And he took to him bow and arrows. He said to the king of Israel, Put your hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. And Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For you shall smite the Syrians in Aphek until you have consumed them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, Smite upon the ground. And he smote three times and stopped. The man of God was wroth with him and said, You should have smitten five or six times. Then you would have smitten Syria till you had consumed it. Now you shall smite Syria but three times. Remember that little incident with the pots of oil, you know, and the pouring in? How many do you bring in? And then the prophet comes along and tells you, Smite the ground. doesn't say how many times. just says, Smite the ground. He smote three times, rather perfunctorily, I suppose. He said, You'll smite Syria but three times. Verse 20. Elisha died, and they buried him. And the hands, bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming end of the year. And it came to pass that as they were burying a man, that, behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast the man, that is the dead body, into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up upon his feet. Now, this is rather fascinating. Do you suppose that there was some magic in his bones? That if you could find them now today, that if you touched them, you could be healed, or somebody could be brought to life if they touched Elisha's bones, if we could find these remnants or his remains somewhere? No, of course not. There was no magic in those bones. God in heaven, when this man touched his bones, decided to bring that man back to life. Now, why would he do that? What's the purpose of that? The point is to say, I think, that the spirit of Elisha was not dead. The spirit lived. The spirit would continue. That God himself was still alive. That the power was still alive. And that it would yet exist. And true, the interesting thing about it is that we are told that Elisha the prophet will be sent at the time of the end. Now, the whole thing, you know, Elisha was a man. And Elisha died. But why this whole thing about taking him away in a fiery chariot someplace? Just letting him get old and die like Elisha did. Why was this done this way? The whole symbolism is that the spirit of Elijah would not die, that that spirit would survive, and that it would find expression again and again and again, and particularly at the very end time. Now, we all know that he was dead and buried. We all know that the man who came and called was called John the Baptist was not Elijah, and was not the same person, didn't have the same fingerprints and the same brain prints, and it was not, didn't have the same face. But we also know that he did have the same spirit, that the spirit of Elijah did not die. And so there will be one at the end time who will come in the spirit of Elijah, will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to the fathers, lest he come and smite the earth with a curse. This event, this raising of a dead man by mere contact with Elisha's bones, has to be highly symbolic, has to have been done by God to convey a message again of the survival of the spirit beyond the life, the physical life, and the breath of a single human being in this circumstance. We've come again to another watershed, and there will be a short period of time now with no evident powerful prophet. But now we are moving very closely into the realm where the first writing prophet will come on the scene. His name will be Amos. He will be writing and dealing with the ten northern tribes, but he's going to have to wait for another day, another time. Now, would you all please rise? Let's turn to number 18, Blessed Assurance, and sing both verses for the closing hymn. Number 18, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Lord, I am Thine. 
Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, drawn of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, promise of rest, I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Standing, please. Our Father in heaven, thank you very much for this beautiful Sabbath day and for this temporary summer like climate in the middle of December. We thank you for both of the messages we have heard today and ask that you would help us to remember them, not only to commit them to our notes, but to commit them to our lives. To remember not to be judging, condemning, criticizing each other, and to drink in deeply of those very moving and meaningful portions of your word that had to do with the great prophets of old and to realize that that spirit is not dead even today and that you have prophesied that a great work must yet be done and that somehow you've called us and given us an opportunity to be a part of a work which will yet shake this earth. And we ask your blessing upon all of us as we go our ways. We ask your continued healing power over Mr. Plante up in Wisconsin your blessing and healing over all of those who are sick or who couldn't be with us today. We commit our lives into your safekeeping. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.